thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Deborah Fisher. I'm the executive director of A Blade of Grass, a first funding nonprofit that's solely dedicated to nurturing socially engaged art. We fund artists and collectives like yourselves that are working directly with communities in ways that are relevant to everyday life at ambitious scale to enact social change. We are accepting applications for the 2015 A Blade of Grass Fellowships for Socially Engaged Art. Uh, they are due November 24th. We're going to be talking about that today. This workshop is designed to help people apply, right? And it's going to consist of a lot more than you know, just kind of going over the guidelines and the stuff that everybody already knows. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to be focusing on two specific ideas. Um, we are working in a really specific uh, in angle on this, right? We have a very specific stake in social practice. We are specifically working with people who are co-creating directly in communities uh, in an ambitious scale in ways that are relevant you know, to people in their communities. Right? So we're going to talk a lot about fit. A lot of really great projects are happening all over the country that don't fit with our guidelines. So we want to make sure that we're clearly articulating exactly what those guidelines are so that we can save you time. Uh, the other thing that we learned uh, last year is that social practice is uniquely difficult to write about in a proposal. Uh, so we're going to be focusing a little bit on what made really competitive proposals excellent, and we're going to be offering some concrete writing advice uh, that is specifically geared toward writing about community-based projects. Uh, because it's a little bit different than writing an artist statement or writing other types of, of writing, okay? So, with that in mind, we have a great lineup. Uh, Noreen Letty and Liz Slagas are going to do, uh, who are current of Lady Grass Fellows for Social Media Chart, are going to uh, give a brief presentation about their project uh, that's going to be geared toward uh, practice. Uh, I'm very excited to hear that. We're going to have a general question and answer session with our uh, programs director, Elizabeth Brady, who's going to be reading all of your proposals along with me, um, and who's also going to be available to answer some questions, uh, either in this context as a group or via email. We're then going to break up into groups, uh, two big groups, and one over here and one over there. At some point, some people might have to move chairs. And uh, we're going to have smaller work sessions that are really focused directly on this notion of fit and how to, how to in writing an excellent proposal. And we're not gonna tell you what to do in these. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna work together, right, to, uh, to kind of workshop ideas and think through the fit. Then we're going to offer uh, an opportunity to sign up for additional help. So one of the things that we're going to try this year is a uh, is kind of a buddy system for uh, signing up for somebody else who's working on a proposal and reading each other's work. So we're going to talk more about that. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Noreen Letty and Liz Slagas. Since 2008, Noreen and Liz have been collaborating on developing radical pedagogies that combine art, reproductive health, and participatory tools. Their project, Sex Ed, is initiating an artist residency and developing an arts-based sexual health curriculum at Washington Irving High School campus in New York City. Sex Ed focuses on key themes identified by students, teachers, and health center staff on campus that include HIV AIDS, gender, healthy relationships, pleasure, and consent. Noreen and Liz, thank you very much. I'm Liz Lakes. And I'm Noreen Lily. <laughs> More sex ed. And uh, we're going to walk you through uh, how we came to work together and some of the intricacies of our process and our practice. So we met early uh, in 2006 at this place that some of you might know, I mean. Uh, which was at the time in Chelsea. I was the director of education and public programs and largely responsible for working with artists uh, who had a participatory or social practice and putting them together with different community groups and finding a context and a space where that work to take place. Thanks, Um 
So I was an artist in residence at IBM in 2006, where I launched um, the Effort ID Project Platforms, which was a collaborative project with um, sex workers and technology leads, where we developed um, shoes together that were based on interviews that I had done with um, sex workers, and then we also had a, a sex worker who was our community advisor. Um, and the shoes were actually these platform sandals that were these beautiful sculptural objects, but then would also, when they went on exhibit, there would be panel discussions where I would insist that a sex worker be present at the panel discussion to also lead a discussion about contemporary sex work and the conditions around contemporary sex work. Uh, in 2007, we found our common love of diners. Uh, yes. I think that might have something to do with the fact that I grew up in New Jersey and Lauren lives there now. But anyway, <laughs> um, we started having dinner together and talking about our common goals, our work, what things that we liked and didn't like in the field, and started talking about ways that we could potentially collaborate. We co um, mounted um, an exhibition at City Without Walls in New York, New Jersey, and then I proposed that we work together on this project, uh, which was Girls I View, which is an arts education model that I had developed putting young women, middle school and high school students together with artists and technologists to create um, projects. And um, I invited Maureen uh, to develop that, um, that uh, spring 2008 project. Yeah, so we, you know, I basically, I showed the the Young Women the Platforms project, we talked about the history of footwear, and then they came up with their own shoe hacks, which were totally amazing. They had like shoes with like Metro card holders, they had shoes with LEDs, they had shoes that they put fur all over. And we had this really great um, runway show at the end that was actually coincided with an IBM fashion book launch that I think Liz had the foresight to put together. So there was a bunch of people there, so it was also not just about making the work, but also about showing the work in some sort of public World. Right, something that we've come to, well, we've continued throughout our work together is our wanting to work in small groups and develop um, something deeply with a small set of people, but then sharing it widely and largely when we can, so finding the right context, which could be a workshop, a runway show, an exhibition, but finding the right way to do that, online tools. Um, uh, so anyway, then life happened, and I left Ivy and went to Australia, Maureen had a baby, um, she continued her art practice and teaching, and then we got together again and we started um, thinking more concretely about how we'd like to work together. We did another exhibition out in New Jersey, and then one night I um, presented her with this brain dump of a drawing um, that to me represented how we wanted to, how we had been talking about working together, and this idea of a project that I thought um, had infinite potential if we did it together and this became sex ed. Um, we, and really how we work still, um, we are <laughs> often in collaboration with other artist groups, work uh, in concert and conversation with sexual health organizations, and we build projects together with community groups, schools, and the like. We document those projects in a way that they can be um, used as curriculum, as tools for actual self, self sex, sorry, sex education, and, um, and can be shared in a variety of ways, online, um, through exhibitions, workshops, and in a variety of contexts. And then at the time, my ultimate goal for the project was to have a pop-up sex education book that would launch a blue stockings. That was my like, total goal for this project. Um, which is still gonna happen eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, so once we decided that this was going to be a collaboration, then obviously we set to sort of refining the drawing down to some really clear goals and making these really, we thought were very hilarious diagrams. Um, but the goal being that we were going to take art projects about sex and sex education and turn them into some kind of actual sex ed curriculum that would be arts based, but you know, basically some sort of add on to other comprehensive sex ed curriculum. Can you do the next slide? Sure. Um, we decided we needed to do some branding. We came up with this logo that we really loved in a whole bunch of rainbow colors, and then sex ed was really kind of born. And we knew that community workshops would really be the guts and the heart of our project, but we wanted to find a different way to reach a broader, larger audience. And um, you can go to the next one. Okay, there you go. Um, and so we came up with the idea of a YouTube video exhibition online. 
and asking people to answer the simple question, what do you wish someone would have taught or told you about sex? It's a pretty amazing question, and it opened the doors to a lot of different conversations uh, for us to have about sexual health. Um, you should try asking it at a dinner party. Yeah, uh, everybody wants to talk about it. <laughs> um, so we started applying for um, exhibitions and grants, um, and we ended up um, getting a show at Coochie Fritos. So we launched Sex Ed Chapter One at Coochie Fritos in February 2013. We had three commissioned artist videos, um, including one by Karen B.K. Chan, who's a really amazing artist and sex educator that went that um, ended up going viral, which was really great for us. Um, and then we also had a really great projects by. Um, Rebecca Herman and Mark Schaffner and Joanna Moscoso. This is actually um, three videos still. It's from Karen's project, um, which is totally amazing. You should all go online. Just call Jan. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we really, like I said, we launched the project with an exhibition with this idea that we didn't want, um, we didn't want to just have people like randomly just coloring in vaginas that we really wanted to talk about. You know? <laughs> we wanted real quality art product. And it was important to have an art exhibition because it's not just an education project, it is an art project. We're not sex educators, it's really important. Um, it's an important distinction for us. We work with sex educators and in conversation with them, but our job with this project, as we see it, is to elevate and highlight that conversation. Um, so the project was, the, the exhibition period was fantastic. It also coincided with our teaching a co-lab class at Parsons um, that fall. Uh, so this is this is spring 2013. Um, our students um, participated in the exhibition. They all created videos for it. They were the stars of a screening um, that took place, public screening at the gallery space, um, and it allowed for a lot of a lot more people to actually join the project through their videos and their voices. Um, to the next. Um, our students that semester also uh, created um, project proposals, um, after school workshops in conversation with and for the Lower East Side Girls Club. Amazing opportunity. Um, they actually got feedback directly from the Lower East Side Girls Club staff and the young women that would have been taking these workshops. Um, so it was a really amazing collaboration. If anybody has the opportunity to teach this kind of class at Parsons, highly recommend it. It's an amazing opportunity for both the students and um, the artists themselves, because basically you invite your students to become collaborators with you on your project for a semester, and work like this can happen. So the end results of, of that final project were things like the period piece, uh, which was uh, meant to be an iterative um, publication um, by and for young women about their periods, which to this day remains a taboo topic, not only in our culture at large, but also sadly in sex education classes in our public schools. Um, other projects included a zine about consent. Um, at the same time, I was also teaching a sort of foundation course at Parsons, and I convinced them to let me have these freshman students design sex education games, um, which is also a really great, really fun experience. Um, because as a lot of you may know, sex education in the US is really not all it could be. Um, so our, my students were really invested in it. They made this really great series of games. And we also had, again, a series of guest speakers kind of coming in both to my class and to the class that Liz and I were teaching together to give the students real feedback on their project. So both feedback from an art perspective, but also feedback from a reproductive health perspective. Um, and one of our guest speakers was Caitlin Hansen, who runs the health center at Washington Urban Campus, which is a series of six New York City public high schools and where we're actually working now. So we first met Caitlin as a guest speaker in our classes, giving us feedback on our student projects. Um, and we just, we really thought, and Caitlin's amazing. She was really excited about the work that our students were doing. And then she invited our students to actually participate in the health fair. So this is our person students actually playing their sex ed games with the students at Washington Irving High School. So that, that semester, um, spring 2013, really set the groundwork for us and our project. Um, we met amazing people. We met um, 
Natalia Nolan Petrozella, who, among other things, is a sex education historian. Um, and she also heads this project called Health Class 2.0, which is reinventing and reimagining um, health and phys ed classes, um, making it more of an inspiring and engaging and positive experience for students. And um, she introduced us to Caitlin. Caitlin's name is going to come up a lot. Um, and uh, we basically worked with Natalia to then write, um, to be part of a grant, we were included in a grant that she was writing for Health Class 2.0, to work also at Washington Irving High School. And we were going to develop a sex education component to her um, Health Class 2.0. So the first thing we did was we came up with a, a way to get into with the students to actually, again, like ask the students what it was that they wanted to learn and what they felt was missing from their sex education. Um, so we just set up this really sort of simple booth uh, during the health fair, which is one of the few times a year that you literally get all the students from all the classes in all the schools, because they all have to take gym, they all have to go to this health fair. <laughs> so it was great. So we literally were able to, I think we got like 300 index cards from students saying what they wish they could learn in sex ed class. Um, and their responses were really pretty amazing. You know, like not just, I mean, there are a lot of questions about birth control, but a lot of really deeper questions that are really about how to navigate human sexuality in the 21st century, right? So things like how do you know your sexual identity? How can you tell if someone has a disease that's not visible? Which to me is really talking about like healthy relationships, right? And when is the right time to have sex? Yeah, this was a huge one, right? Because it's not that these kids don't necessarily know how to use a condom, right? They have that. This is New York City. There is comprehensive, comprehensive sex education. But they still, despite knowing how to use a condom, they still don't have the answer to when is the right time to have sex, which is a much more difficult question. So these, this actually set the tone for how we would go about our research entering different community groups. We needed to be on the ground and in direct contact with the community members that we would be working with because we wanted the projects to come from them. So those index cards became what we built um, our poster project around for um, Health Class 2.0. And basically, we decided to build, um, to create poster, a poster campaign with the students about um, their idea of a healthy relationship. Yeah. So our first class, um, we actually sat down with the students. It was like just in gym class, right? Because we were taking over this gym class. And you know, we asked like 30-something high school freshmen, basically, like what they thought a healthy relationship was and how they wanted to feel in a healthy relationship. So unprompted by Liz and myself, we tried to really keep it to sort of their words, their language, and we all together came up with this kind of collaborative definition. We also showed them Barbara Kruger and Grand Fury <laughs> and talked about the effectiveness of um, poster campaigns, right? What makes a good message, how to set things up. And showed them how artists have actually used collage and posters to get a point across extremely effectively, if we recall, um, how that work proliferated and got word out about the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. Um, so then we took their words, their definition, and printed those words out so that they could use a collage technique. They could either write the words themselves or use, like we said, we had printed out their words and then make their own collage poster. So following this project, we um, went into our second year of our collab at Parsons um, in spring 2014. And we basically continued to craft our relationship and collaborative potential with university students, which long after um, our Parsons class um, ends, um, which I think we only have one semester left, um, we only let you teach these things a couple times because um, they're that good. Um, we want to be able to run this class again. It's an amazing way to engage university level students, and that's an age group that we really want to continue to work with. Um, we always start our class with the question, um, how would you describe your sex education? And we have our students draw and then talk about it, and we go around the room um, and all discuss um, what that experience was like. Maureen and I start. Um, and it's amazing, we do that for a couple of reasons, but the main one is to really gauge our spectrum of sexual health education, um, what our personal experiences were, um, what people got and didn't get 
Um, and really, the realization often comes from a Canadian student who is like, it's really fucked up here in the US, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes it is. Um, but we also got some really amazing results. Um, but it puts us all on the same page. And, um, and then we follow that up with some rigorous training, introducing our new collaborators to um, a line of resources and um, people who are out in the field um, disseminating sexual health information and the techniques that they use to engage people. Um, we talk about and critique those methods and, um, and then talk about and make them our own. So we had some really amazing, we've mentioned Natalia um, Katayoun is a professor at Parsons um, Molecular Cellular Biology and she talked about HPV, scared the crap out of our students, but it was a really good session. Um, and we had remember, the Peer Health Exchange talk about consent. Um, a doctor and um, a student collective come from Student Health Services to talk about their techniques and talk about, and do a Q&A uh, about um, human sexuality um, from a medical um, perspective. Um, we had one of our favorite people on the planet, who's now part of our board, Corey Silverberg, who um, was launching his book, What Makes a Baby, and he is a sex educator from Canada. Um, so we also included these rules that we created with our students for like how do we create a safe space, because we felt like this was also part of our practice and how we work. So there's a whole, you know, you guys have probably heard of things like don't yuck my yum and one mic, one diva and stuff like that. Um, but we actually came up with this whole other set of rules for our students because we had a whole talk with them because we were actually were able to send them to Washington Irving to lead their own art and sex education session. So that was kind of the end project of the CoLab class. So before we sent them into a classroom, it was obviously our job to make sure that they were prepared and ready to go. And part of what we all came up together was this definition of how we were going to make our classroom a safe space and how we were going to make uh, the classrooms at Washington Irving a safe space because we were talking about really sensitive information that can make people feel really vulnerable, among other things. Um, and you know, one of the great conversations we had with them where they were like, I think don't yuck my yum is really kind of like condescending and I don't actually want to talk down to high school students. I think we need to come up with our own definitions. But again, just this idea that we're sort of involving them in the process from the get-go. Um, and they did <laughs> this really amazing, hilarious series of poster projects. This is my personal favorite. Um, but we had them do posters. You know, we had them do lots of individual art projects as well. Again, before we send them talk to high school students. Um, but yeah, so this is one of the posters, which I think would make a really amazing kind of street campaign. All um, of which are actually downloadable um, yeah. now, and people are actually emailing us. We actually ask people to email us and tell us how they're using the posters. But all we've made all of this work available to people as long as they credit our students and where yeah. the work came from. Yeah, so if you go to our website, you too can have this awesome cat call poster. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we also have our students um, make uh, videos in response to, again, our question of sort of what do you wish that someone had taught or told you about sex. And again, we really encourage them to make this something personal and relevant to them. So this is, we've actually got, I think, three of these videos now. But um, this is a really great example of like porn versus reality. And they just felt like they hadn't gotten sex ed in school, that both they and all their friends were learning about sex from porn. And now they've had all this real sex ed information and this like huge gap between right being 21, 22 and having some understanding of sex versus what they had learned at 16 through pornography. So this really great like two minute video that just kind of like lays it out in a nutshell, like the difference between porn so just, and again, like if you just think about how you could use this tool, it's available online for people to use as a great prompt to like talk to high school students about this issue, for example. And their final projects, which were actually enacted again inside Washington Irving, um, ran the gamut of workshops. This was actually um, a student group who decided to tackle um, social media and all the pitfalls um, there. Um, and decided to do that through um, a platform um, dissecting sexting. So they did this whole game um, that took place in the cafeteria so students would come during their lunch time and engage with them and play this game and actually help create the game because they were, they designed it in such a, the interaction in such a way that the students were actually building the playing cards as they were participating in the conversation, which was pretty great. Yeah, and giving like real world examples of things that either happened to them or happened to their friends and talk to them about how they got handled. 
And one of the exciting things is that somebody from Planned Parenthood um, actually emailed us about using this um, in their curriculum because nobody that she knew of had tackled it yet. And she loved because these cards are awesome looking because they're designed by artists. The look and the feel of these and designed with students, so artists with students. And so here we are now. Um, so this is the sex ed team, and we are set to go into Washington Irving Educational Complex, thanks to a blade of grass. Um, we, um, that person in the middle is Caitlin Hansen, who we keep mentioning, and she is our partner. Um, she is our anchor, she's our guide, she's our support. She's the director of the school-based health center at Washington Irving. Um, and she really represents how we want to continue to work with partners moving forward. This project is going to move on from school to school, from community group to community group, um, and we might not get as lucky as we have been with Caitlin. Um, she, bas she basically is now part of the project. She is part of our sexual health um, advisory board, which we realized that we needed. Uh, Noreen and I bring the art and the practice, the social practice in that way to the table, but again, we're not sex educators. We don't claim to be, we don't want to be necessarily. It's not the idea of the project. Um, we need these people to be part of this team. And Paul is um, a psychologist and researcher at NYU, and Cor that's Corey Silverberg there, who's the sex educator from um, Canada. And they advise us on our projects and our curriculum and really help to make the project what it is. Um, Tina is actually a researcher at NYU, so she's done these big kind of long-term studies with like teenagers and sort of risk behaviors, so we're really excited to have her. She's actually helping us to map actual um, scientific research around our project, um, which we know we'll need if we apply to different kinds of grants, because this project has the ability to not just necessarily apply for arts-based grants, but scientific ones as well, humanitarian, um, and they're going to want those stats. Um, and you know, one of the things that really helps this, this project and this partnership, I think, to be so strong is, um, is transparency and clarity. And, um, and I think sometimes, particularly when money isn't being exchanged, you know, at the, at the high school, they're not paying us to be their artists and residents. We're bringing that to the table. Um, we decided we needed to draft a memo of understanding, um, which isn't a contract. It's not, you know, like, we're not signing this in blood, but it's this idea of like really needing to be concrete about what everyone's goals are for the project and having an agreement about that, a kind um, agreement that everyone's excited to sign. And, um, and we have that in addition to just this great relationship with Keeper. Um Yes, and so we are now part of the <laughs> New York City Department of Education. Um, we had to, you know, get fingerprinted and background checked and all that good stuff. Um, you know, because you were there, and you know, I, I totally understand it, but it really gives you this whole other insight into why, how like public schools work the way they do. <laughs> but the more fun part of that project <laughs> is actually the projects that we're going to make there. And um, through a conversation that we had recently with our sexual health advisory board, um, we basically narrowed down our project to a wearables project about either consent or healthy relationships. Um, some of the feedback that we got was really that it needed to come from a personal perspective, and those were the two topics that we could speak to best. Um, both Corey and Tina really felt that, you know, um, in order to tackle a project about HIV, um, it, it often helps to have someone who is positive or have that to be part of the project. Um, and uh, similarly, um, a gender-based project. So we'll save those when we have partners um, that we can work um, very deeply with on those. Um, but so right now we're researching our materials that we're going to use. Um, yeah, so we said wear, wear, wearables and one of those things. So right now we're researching materials, but then we are also setting up meetings with the staff and students at Washington Irving, right, to also help us figure out exactly what these projects are gonna be. So we've been looking at things like, you know, heat sensitive fabric that actually like changes color when you touch it, which would make really great like wearables project. And it's but particularly about it, about consent. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, we've been talking about t-shirts that either work together, you have to like have all the t-shirts together to read a message, that kind of thing. Um, but we have these sort of vague ideas, but then the, the nuts and bolts and all the sort of final stuff will come after we've had more meetings with um, with teachers, students, 
and then also the sex educator at Washington Irving. Right. The health center staff, yeah. Um, so uh, just some exciting news. We actually, exactly a week ago today, um, Nori and I became officially partners. Um, Lino Projects was born um, at a new stand at 26 Court Street, which is how apparently business is done in New York City. Um, the candy behind me, um, who knew that you could get a snack and get your partnership notarized, because yeah, the stand has a certificate pad at the ready. Um, and you know, it's just kind of a crazy experience, but um, and one that we did for pra practical, pragmatic reasons, you know, taxes and getting paid. And um, but the really kind of great thing was that um, it was this exercise of really putting our goals down together. We created, we drafted an agreement between ourselves, and um, and then and, and had the partnership officially recognized, which I didn't really think I needed, and I don't need, but. It was kind of lovely, and and I think that th those small and large gestures, official, not official, documented and not, are kind of what really makes um, our collaboration work, and I think are at the heart of a lot of um, social practices. And thanks for listening. Anybody have questions for Nuri and Liz? Um, and then we'll, we'll keep on with the program. Hi, um, my name is Vikria. And I was wondering, as you guys were going through the presentation, like, oh my goodness, this is a wonderful project, and it has so many aspects and levels to it. So I was wondering if you can shortly just sum up how in the world did you convey that through your project proposal when there's just so many layers to this thing? There were a lot of heads. But actually, the thing that I forgot to mention, in addition to Caitlin just being an amazing person and partner, she helped us write this, and so did Tina. Um, and I think it was just really having, we were very clear about what the project is, if you can't tell by the drawing. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that it is an art project, you know, and I think that helped us. We've both done education for many, many years, um, so it was easy to write about that. It's not always easy to write about it as an art project. Um, so that kind of became our focus, and the other stuff, in a way, kind of fell in line. Yeah. And I think we've really, like, we even included, like, quotes from our community partner, too. Like, I felt like, or, I mean, I know you guys can speak to this, but I felt like it was kind of clear from our proposal that it wasn't just, like, us sort of glomming on it and starting us ourselves somewhere, that there was, like, this real kind of, like, dialogue and really kind of working together. So there were like quotes from Caitlin's discussions. I felt like we really, like it was really woven throughout that it was like, it was not just us deciding we were gonna do this thing and kind of foist it upon yeah. people. That There's it was a lot of real, parts and people involved. Yeah. And research, we do a lot of research. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, what part of all this was actually um, like post the Blade of Brass and how much did you do already before you proposed? We had the exhibition at Coochie Fritos and taught that Parsons collab, and we were actually, um, we were already in Washington Irving um, that fall doing the Health Class 2.0 work. That was when we started applying. Yeah. So at this point, what I'd like to do actually, since we're kind of moving in that direction, is talk a little bit about um, our selection criteria just really quickly, um, we'll have more opportunity for a little bit closer kind of uh, contact with staff following this segment, but I want to give you guys the opportunity to just kind of review what we're doing. Um, and I want to uh, kind of highlight a couple of key things here. Um, when, when I talk about criteria, um, you know, it's really tempting, I know, because, you know, especially when I was starting out with this from a curatorial perspective, but it's really tempting to try to apply for as many things as possible and kind of shoehorn your project into it. What we as an organization are looking for, and I think really what most funders are looking for, is a really good partnership, a really good fit. Because what we want is for our goals to align, because then we're going to be able to help you in the best way possible, instead of having the help kind of go sideways from what you're doing, it's not quite the right match. 
And there, there are a number of reasons for this. One is clarity of purpose, right? For us as an organization, we have a mission, right? Um, and, you know, if we had all the resources in the world, maybe we'd have a whole bunch of different, you know, niches for our grants. But what we have are resources that are really good for artist fellowships of a certain stripe. And that's what we fund, and we, we've narrowed the criteria to fund a specific mission that we feel like we can do really effectively, right? Um, and so when you're thinking about your proposal and whether it's a fit, keep in mind that we love a lot of different things. But the things that are gonna make it through the process, the things that the selection committees are going to select are gonna be the things that have a really good fit, right? So, we ask our reviewers to look at a few different things um, when they're looking at your applications. It's a two-stage process. First, readers go through all the applications and narrow them down, and then about 50 people are invited back to submit a full proposal. And we do that out of respect for your time. We don't want you to write a giant full proposal if you're competing with 500 other people. Right? That kind of isn't very fair. So what we want is a letter of interest. And then we say, oh, you know what? This is a great fit. Tell us more. Right? So we have the, the reader's process, which narrows it down. And we have the selection process that gets us through. Um, the specific questions we ask reviewers to consider are these. This is exactly what we send to them. Okay? Um, artistic excellence is one area. Does the artist have a strong track record? This doesn't have to mean that you had a show at MoMA, okay? What we want to see is that, that you're a focused artist who is a professional, who this isn't just sort of, you know, you're not sort of a Sunday painter, this is something that's serious for you, um, and um, that you've been, been sort of building consistently, right? That's all we need. Emerging artists are totally welcome to apply. Is the project ambitious? That means a lot of different things. Right? It doesn't mean that you have to have the biggest project that ever existed, right? Noreen and Liz are focusing on one high school. I actually, it's a consortium of high schools, but it's one building. Um, is it aesthetically compelling? Is it more than community service? Right? What's the art part? Um, can it act as a leading example in the field of socially engaged art? Is it a good example? When we put your project together with the projects of the six other fellows, are we going to get a good picture of what this practice is developing as and turning into? Um, another thing we look at is the project's capacity to enact social change. This is part of our mission. Uh, does it approach an issue in a new way? Does it otherwise offer an opportunity for innovation? Here's a key one. Does it enact as opposed to represent social change? There's political art that you hang on the wall that sits in a gallery, right? And then there's art that's in the community really working with people to push change forward. The kind that sits on the wall is important. It informs people. We like that too. It's just not what we find, okay? Um, if the project is ongoing, does the proposal represent meaningful growth in the project? Are you doing this or are you doing this? Right? Um, is the project aesthetically or formal, formally innovative? What's different from everybody else who's looking at community gardens right, or whatever it is? Um, the project's viability in everyday life. Does the project uh, attract the interest of non-artist stakeholders? Does it meaningfully, meaningfully engage a community? Is it legitimately helpful? Is its language externally focused? That is, can people who aren't can art world people understand what you're talking about? Right. Um, is it meaningful in the absence of a contemporary art context or an initiated audience? Who is it for? Is it for the people in this room? Or is it for a broader group? Right? Um, and is it feasible? Right? If, it, if it looks like something that can't happen, the committee it needs to know more about how you're, how you're doing things in order to, to get what you're after. 
uh, fit with resources? Uh, is is uh, the artist working independently as an individual or collective? In other words, are you uh, are you an individual and not an org? Right. Um, will you or your project benefit from a supportive cohort of other artists working on similar projects? This is where fit comes in. What we offer is not just a check. It's a whole system of supports. There's documentation, there's assessment, and there's quarterly meetings, which are co-assessment and working together to problem solve and learn about um, the practice, right? Um, and so if you're at a place where that's not going to help you, again, it's not a good fit. Excuse me. Um, will you benefit from what we have to offer? Institutional assistance, contacts, consultation. Um, and uh, is this a project that can benefit from having its story told through an external voice? One of the things that we do is we do video documentation, we do online publication, and we do print publication. This set of documentation is intended to translate the work for a broader audience. It's kind of a museum without walls approach. If your project doesn't really lend itself to that kind of translation, it's also probably not a very good fit. At this point, what I'd like to do, I think most of you have probably looked at the website already. What I'd like to do briefly is to uh, open the floor up to questions about fit, about our selection criteria, in a general way. How is it that in the proposal you define the model of social change that you're naming? Like, is it structural, like with policy implementation, or is it about interpersonal engagement or internalized manifestations of whatever issue or system of oppression you might be working on? We intentionally leave that a little bit loose um, because we don't want to shut people down. Um, and we don't pretend to have a full understanding of every kind of change that anybody could possibly think of, right? Um, and so that's sort of the short answer. The longer answer is that we are looking for things that make, um, make a substantive difference. Usually there's an intersection between a broader social justice issue and the way it impacts personal lives. Usually it's not exclusively um, dedicated to changing the lives of a couple specific individuals, right? Usually there's an intersection between those two, but not exclusively, right? And there are also things that are important for social change that aren't necessarily focused on social justice per se, like one of our, um, our artists, you'll read um, her initial letter of interest in a few minutes, um, is focused on an environmental project, right? And so it's a different kind of, of change which impacts us. So it, it's it's fairly loose on purpose. Next question. Can you clarify uh, at what point in the development process you're looking for? It sounds like you are presuming that the community has been identified and engaged before we present a proposal. Great question. Um, the projects that tend to be best articulated are projects where a community has been engaged with in an initial way, where a community has been identified. And that's simply because through the process of co-creation and starting the conversation, you're able to more specifically talk about what, what it is that your plan is. Um, it doesn't mean that we are uninterested in, in the, the, the initial stages of an artistic process, we understand that's part of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but usually things get a little bit clearer once they develop a little bit, and so those are the proposals that tend to look a little stronger on paper. Does that make sense? So say you have a beta-tested project of an ambitious scale, um, it's interdisciplinary, and you have a current funder who is particularly interested in helping certain parts of the project, is it counterintuitive to also be applying for this fellowship to scaffold the social practice part of the project? Absolutely not. Um, we hope that we're not your only funder. We hope that you have tons and tons of support. And we understand that the scale of these things can be massive. Uh, and so that's it's totally legitimate. 
Um, another thing that I want to clarify, which is sometimes a question, is the fiscal sponsorship question. If you're trying to become an org, you're probably not a great fit. But if you're an artist with a fiscal sponsorship so that you can apply for other grants, completely legitimate. Okay? If you happen to be an LLC, Noreen and Liz are an LLC. They're not an org. An LLC is a legal designation. It's a way for them to get the checks written to them and not to one or the other of them. And so that's, that's another thing that, that's okay. They're not a company. They're really an artist collective. Right, but they have that least legal designation for essentially for tax purposes, right? And so all of those, we kind of understand all of the, the way those things shake out. I just want to clarify one point on that, which came up a lot last year in the process. Um, the distinction between an organization and an individual and why we're making this distinction. Um, one of the things that we care a lot about is the fact that a lot of individual artists are, uh, are doing these really ambitious projects, right, that last over many years and that require lots of different kinds of funding streams. And, and that um, one of the first trends that we noticed when we started our very short organizational life is that artists are tending to seek 501c3 status for art projects. Uh, and this, as somebody who runs a 501c3 right now, uh, is a tremendous administrative burden and so one of the things that we're trying to do is alleviate that tremendous <laughs> administrative burden. So um, by focusing on individuals, we're, we're really uh, trying to influence, influence that and make it so that individuals don't have to incorporate you know, in order to do a good thing. Yeah, okay. Super helpful. okay. So are you more interested in process or product? Uh, actually, one of the things that I think distinguishes this kind of work is a focus on the process. And in some ways, the process is the product, if that makes any sense. Um, we have a, a actually a, a deep love of, of watching an artistic process develop and participating in that to the degree that it's desired and appropriate. Um, and so that the, 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 the process is, is very central to the way that we look at these things. And we look at the way something is developed, not just what it turns into. Um, and so we see that as an aesthetic thing. If when we say we're interested in the aesthetics, we don't mean we're interested in a thing. Um, that's, that's, I think, the best way to put it. Before, when I first found out about the organization, Data Brass, it was visual art mainly. And then it, it started to open up to performance art. That's right. So has the selection criteria or that panel changed because of that? And have the guidelines been changed also because so it's more inclusive? Because for me, it's still sounding more visual art, even though it might not be that. We, we developed out of a visual art context. There are projects and, um, and groups that we have funded which are more specifically performance oriented. Um, and what we see is actually really interesting is the intersection between um, visual art and uh, a lot of different sort of performance studies perspectives, and that can be uh, theater, it can be dance, it can be a lot of different things. And so the, the criteria as they are written incorporate, we feel like enough, we got a lot of non-visual art proposals last time around, and so they feel broad enough to, to allow for that. I wonder if there's a particular time frame that you're thinking about like, does a project have to reveal something within 2015? Great question. Can it continue through? Great question. It's an interesting one because um, some of these projects are really long term and they, they go over many, 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 many years. And it's okay to have sort of a snapshot of that within the grant year, right? You're doing this big thing that's happening over 15 years and this is one piece of your puzzle. There has to be something, I would say, that's tangible enough that it makes sense for, for you to uh, take advantage of our assessment and documentation services. Is there something there to assess within the next year, fellowship year? Is there something there to discuss with other artists in the quarterly meetings as part of the cohort? 
And um, is there something there that, that works for, for the documentation <coughs> tool that we'll, we're providing? Every single one of the projects that we're funding this year has an ongoing or iterative nature. So in every single one of these projects uh, is encapsulating you know, one year of activity in a much larger thing. Yeah. yeah. So we're not averse to that. Yeah, not a bit. Um, so at this point, what I'd like to do is divide the group roughly in half. And I'm going to pass out a few things to be read. The first thing is two really excellent examples of uh, fellowship proposals that were uh, that became fellowship projects. The second thing that I'm going to pass out is uh, a little more information about. Um, what made proposals uncompetitive last year? This is something that's going to change every year because you know the, the field is changing. But it's useful information. Um, I just want to talk about um, the things that are making these projects successful, right? Because one of the interesting things is about writing about your own work is that it's unique. You know, it's so uh, not every project. So you know, you can't copy Jan or Joe. You have to, you know. Figure out what works for you. So, uh, so when you're ready, break them into groups of like three to five, and uh, and we'll and we'll just talk about your own project, and the things that are making this proposal good, right? And the things that it brings up in your project you might want to highlight. Sound good? Okay. So people have a lot of really great questions for each other. Right, um, which was really, which is a really important part of the you know, ID and writing process. We're going to talk a little bit about that ne next. And then the other thing is that people uh, have a lot of solutions, uh, have a lot of ideas and solutions for one another. Right. So uh, I just want to go around group to group and just uh, like give me, just give us a sense of what you talked about and how uh, and what did you come to any conclusions? Yeah. Uh, so as a group, we all went around and we introduced ourselves, set our basic project ideas, and then we talked about the letters, yeah. the two letters, and talked about why each of us thought these were successful letters. What came out as, as, as reasons? Uh, one of the, the big things we thought was the, the fact that the products were reaching a broad audience, and it wasn't just something that was happening within sort of traditional art context where there were different partner organizations involved and they were uh, making an impact. And so basically, you know, we've got we've got some ideas about you know the idea that it's serving a public that's not an art public, that there's specific partners identified, so it's not serving like the public actually, like neither of these projects are. They're, so they're also uh, serving very concrete, specific publics that are identified and, and, and drawn out in the proposal. What did you guys talk about? Um, we talked about our projects, and um, I got a question about my project. Um, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, one of which was, um, like, where is the art? <laughs> and um, how is that needed to be, like, is, is it visual? Yeah. My, 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 yeah, so um, that's a good question, because I was, I'm much more wrapped in the process mm -hmm. than, like, physical art, you know, yeah. the visual of it, necessarily, but does it need to have a balance of the two, kind of? Yeah, well, and one of the things that we're really going to, and we're going to talk about this in the next kind of segment, which is, is this problem of writing about these projects because they're complex, right? Like there's this, there's this vision component, there's this uh, community component, there's this social justice component, you know, there's this implementation component, right? Like, so yeah, all of those things, it's, it's a task, you know, to balance all of those things, for sure. Yeah, and we are looking for a balanced proposal. I think that one of the things that both of these proposals do is they balance vision and implementation, for example. You know, or they balance you know, why you want to do a project and how you're going to get it done. You know, that sort of thing. Um, any, any other things that came out of this, this group that you want to share? I mean, we broke off, I think, with maybe clarity. Yeah. How you articulate. Yeah. Some questions of. Uh, she said it to you. Yeah. She didn't feel like she was communicating it, but she was able to flesh it out. Totally. And this is something that happens like, I'm, I'm coming at this 
this as a practitioner, I, I, I've been making art for a couple of decades and I still make art. So, um, um, clarity around a project that is not particularly verbal and coming to that is, a, is, is, is its own, you know, Herculean task, you know what I mean? And, and when it involves people and making sure that those relationships are articulated clearly, because that is something that we're looking for. You know, we're not necessarily just looking for, um, you, you know, uh, it, it's good on the internet, you know, or, 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 um, or whatever. It's, 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 it's really, it's so, social practice is social, you know, so clearly articulating those relationships is key, and that's not easy at all. Yeah, so clarity, definitely. How about this group? What did you guys talk about? We did a little bit of talking about each other's projects. Yeah. And we took some time to sort of listen to what um, the, where each person was coming from. We lost a couple of our members along the way. <laughs> yeah. Other obligations and, and time commitments. One of the things that was, I, I think, it's something that you both shared was uh, coming to the table or to this, to this convening with a few different ideas of trying to think about which would be the right fit or mm -hmm. how to move forward and trying to sort of navigate where to steer your um, energy, right? energy in the most effective way. Um, and, and, that, and, and maybe mine was a little more focused and directed, but I'm also trying to figure out to what extent is the collaboration and partnership I have with an NGO working to the advantage of this proposal and, yeah. and that partnership with the NGO is fairly well established now but but I also am feeling like I need support as an individual artist yeah. to help um, help be a kind of a little support behind me to make sure that the art is the yep. leading force in this initiative. So, and then it becomes art and not something yeah. else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I kind of have a similar issue, but yeah. a different problem where I'm working with the community and it's the project is stuck in one phase, kind of the awareness phase, mm -hmm. and getting through a process of um, creative iteration to get to what the art form you know, is. So um, we were kind of discussing well, is the project ready? Well, is the process part of the project um, um, proposal? One idea was to like workshop, to take the group and say, okay, this is where we're at. We have this opportunity um, as an, you know, with me as an artist, um, working with you. What do you want to make? How do you want to make the thing um, to have the social change happen? So I'm sure if, um, a lot of us are practitioners within the group. And, if you're working on a socially engaged issue, racism, hunger, whatever, people get stuck in the, like, the awareness phase. Like, yeah. this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And we're like, now hey, <laughs> you know, we got it out there, we said it eight different ways, and we made pictures, and the drawings, and the yeah. mural, and the, but that, that inner, the innovative part, like what's the innovative part? That's where I'm stuck with my, my folks, so we talk yeah. about that. What did you guys talk about? Well, um, I think we have a lot of similar similar things. Some of them with your group, I think she was worried about the, they're working with the 501c3 organization yeah. and worried about partnerships. Yeah, just to catch your spare rooms here is the proposal. Partnerships are, are important, right? And one of the things that both Jan and Jody had in their proposals is uh, clearly defined partnerships with other uh, organizations. Right, like they, they need this. Yeah. But it, but initially it also came up as because they were able to contact individuals in a very therapeutic way, mm -hmm. how to document that and do the project at the same time. Yeah. And this is something that was important for your organization to get funding to mm -hmm. be able to publicize. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's a great issue, and it's something that we talk about a lot. Uh, and thank you for bringing it up because I can I can talk I can talk a little bit about this. Uh, a couple of the projects that we're working with right now have a lot of sensitivity around uh, representation. And this is something that, uh, so Lori Jo Reynolds' project is, uh, 
is working with people, you know, who are dealing with very traumatic things. It's sex like kids, like, A, they're in high school, and B, they're talking about their sex lives. You know, I mean, it's not appropriate for us to go there with the documentary anger, right? Um, uh, who else is really thinking a lot about it? Jan Lund's project has a, has a lot of, of, is this kind of delicate symphony of partnerships, right? You know, that are, that are very, delicately balanced, you know, and we don't want to, Jody's project is, is about intimacy, you know, so one of the things that we're really thinking a lot about is how to tell these stories in a healthy way without disturbing the ecosystem. I mean, one of the things that we're really actively working on this year is that um, when we document this work, we have to work in partnership with the artists themselves to ensure that every single thing that we do uh, is in service of their social change goals and it, you know the imbalances that. Let's move on to the next thing because I think they're breaking up. Um, I would start, um, I would leave with this idea that writing about social practice is uniquely difficult because it's balancing um, like who, what, when, where, and why, and vision, and you know, and, and, and the goal that's way up here, and the fact that it's happening with people that you have to know really well. And so what we've done is uh, we've asked some very specific questions on this handout, which I propose to write for my time. And we also really encourage, and we're, uh, we will, there's no way to, to do this because you can't replicate Jody's uh, or Jan's thing. It's important. Your project is specific. It needs to be written with your voice and your lens, right? So what we do, what we want to do is we want to invite people to sign up for what we're calling uh, basically a buddy system. Um, here's what we're going to do. I need you first to know that uh, if you have any questions whatsoever, if you send them to info at oblivious.org, Elizabeth will get back to you with an answer within 23 business days. It's really important to us uh, to be accessible for questions. Uh, it's a, it's a key part of what we do, so do ask questions. Uh, don't feel abandoned. We're also, uh, uh, we also think that it's really important to uh, focus on writing. One of the things that happened in this first year is that projects that are, uh, a lot of projects that uh, are amazing, you know, were written about in ways that were difficult for the selection you know what I mean? And it's just the nature, of, and it's the nature of writing, and it's the nature of articulating a project that's for, that's not very normal, and it's about the nature of, of dealing with people, right? So we're going to put together some tips that, that start thinking about this. These are great questions to ask yourself about writing in general. And then we also uh, invite you, if you're interested, in uh, joining a club. This club is going to be an email club. It's going to be random. Uh, we don't actively administer it. If you wind up in a lame club, you can't take responsibility for that. But um, <laughs> what we want to do is assign people, uh, people to groups of three on a first come, first serve basis. So the first three email address, emails that come in will be assigned to the group, right? Uh, this will just be an email that introduces you guys to one another. You're free to organize this group any way you want. You guys can just pass emails, you can sit in a cafe together, you can do whatever you want to do. We're opening this up to people nationwide, so that's interesting. This is a national open call, you might be here with somebody who's in St. Louis, or Chicago, and that's a cool opportunity. Um, let's see, the last, I just need to say a couple more things. Um, if you are one of the last two people that signs up for her, you will be made to appear, right? And the last day, to make an assignment to this group is November 10th, okay? So anytime before November 10th, you're free to be a part of this group. This group can do anything you want it to do. We take no responsibility for any of the group's interactions, the level of engagement of the group members, or anything else. We can't reassign you if you don't like your group, okay? Sound good? Any parting questions? I'm really glad that I got to learn about your projects, and I really appreciate your time, and I look forward to reading your proposals. Thank you so much. Yeah.